Now it is my honor to introduce the man who needs no introduction. Larry King was the host for 25 years of CNN's Larry King Live, the first worldwide phone-in television talk show and the network's highest rated program. The Emmy award-winning King and author of multiple books has been dubbed the most remarkable talk show host on TV ever by TV Guide and master of the mic by Time Magazine. Larry King Live debuted on CNN in June 1985 with this now famous mix of celebrity interviews, political debates, and topical discussions. When King made the transition from his successful national radio talk show to cable, he helped define the future of cable news programming and CNN as we know it today. King has been asking famous people questions throughout his career, having accumulated more than 40,000 interviews, including ones with every U.S. president since the Ford administration. He has broken cable industry rankings with his vast viewership. For example, his famed NAFTA debate between Al Gore and Ross Perot in 1993 obtained the highest rating in CNN history. For decades, King has been shaping how we understand and engage with the most important historical events of our generation. After Hurricane Katrina hit the U.S. Gulf Coast in 2005, Larry King Live broadcasted for 20 consecutive nights with more than 250 guests, including the three-hour network special, How You Can Help. And after September 11, King interviewed more than 700 guests, including more than 35 world leaders and dignitaries. King has been honored for his role in increasing public awareness of some of the most important issues of our time. These include his programming on minority issues, depression, neuroscience, and community volunteerism. In addition to helping society engage with the needs of our world, King is making his own personal contributions. He founded the Larry King Cardiac Foundation, which has raised millions of dollars and provided life-saving cardiac procedures for needy children and adults. In addition, King funds journalism scholarships for students from disadvantaged backgrounds at George Washington University School of Media and Affairs. Please join me in welcoming Larry King. Thank you. First, it, it is me. I don't want to compliment the uh, valedictorian speech, who I understand is a major in communications. One advice I would give her is to keep a little fire in the, in the belly, too. It might hold you in good stead. I am particularly pleased to come to San Diego today. One, because uh, this is the most beautiful part of the United States. And this is a great institution and a wonderful ceremony. And I'm always pleased to attend them because I guess I've given, this is probably be my 10th or 11th commencement speech. And I'm always awed by it because I never got to go to college. In fact, I barely got out of high school. I got out of high school by begging the dean to let me out. But I had what I guess is the title of this speech is Perseverance. I always, always wanted to be a broadcaster. I didn't want to be anything else. When I was five, six years old, I would listen to the radio and radio programs were on, and I would imitate the radio program. You know, there were programs called <clears throat> The Shadow. Yeah, and a voice, a man would come on and say, who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> the Shadow knows. And then I'd run into my bathroom, close the door, look in the mirror, and do the same thing because I wanted to do that. I wanted to do lights out and suspense. 
I went around to radio shows, knocked around at odd jobs. My father died when I was only nine and a half, so I couldn't go to college. I had to help my mother at odd jobs. My brother did go to college. Finally, I got out, and I had perseverance. I wanted what I wanted, and I knew what I wanted to do. It's a very good idea to set a goal. You don't always meet the goal, but sometimes there's just as much fun in setting it, just as much fun in going for it. Well, I wanted mine, bad. And I met a man in Manhattan, James Sermons. He was, he was head of announcers at CBS. And I said, I want to get in the radio, what should I do? And he said, go down to Miami. It's a big city, got a lot of stations, no union, so they're either men and women on the way up or on the way out. So I went down to Miami, stayed with my uncle in a little, little condominium and knocked on doors, got thrown out by radio stations. But one station, a small station, hired me. And they said, we think you have some talent. The first person gets fired or leaves, you got the job. Wow, I hung around that station, I swept up the floors. I watched them do news, I watched them do sports, I watched them do disc jockey work, interviews, anything, just to absorb it, waiting for my break. Then one day I got it. On Friday, the general manager called me in, he said, Larry, Tom Baird just quit. He quit because he was making $50 a week and his alimony was $60 a week. Tom Bear, not a mathematical genius, figured out that he cannot survive. So he said, he's leaving, you got the job. This was Friday. Monday morning, you'll be on the air from 9 to 12. You'll play records and you'll talk. In the afternoon, you'll do sports and news. You'll be paid $50 a week. Go get them. Well, folks, I went home that weekend and I never slept. I kept prowling the rooms. Good morning, good morning, I'm Larry, here's my record. Good morning, good morning. My name was Larry Zeiger at the time, it was legally changed later. So I kept saying, my name is Larry Zeiger. My name is Larry Zeiger. Good morning, how does this sound? My name, I never slept. <laughs> now I get to the radio station, it's the morning of my debut. Debut, May 1st, 1957. My dream is about to come true. The general manager of the station called me and he said, we're ready for you, Larry, we wish you a great career. What name are you gonna use? I said, I gotta go on the air in five minutes and I don't have a name. He says, well, and he had the paper open, the Miami Herald, and there was an ad for King's Wholesale Liquors. <laughs> and so he said, why not, why not Larry King? I said, why not? <laughs> so I was Larry King. Now I go into the broadcast booth, picture this. My theme song is Les Elgard swinging down the lane. Da 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 dum, da 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 dum. I'm gonna fade the record, turn on the mic, and speak. I fade the record, I turn on the mic, nothing comes out. <laughs> I bring up the record, I fade the record, I bring, and then I look at the clock, it's four minutes after nine, and I say to myself, well, I tried, but I can't do it. I don't have the guts. I thought I had it, I don't have the persistence, I thought I had it. Maybe I just wasn't cut out for it, I'm too scared. And the general manager kicked open the door to the control room and he said, Larry, this is a communications business, damn it, communicate. <laughs> and he shut the door and I did something then that I would do today and I learned something then that I would do today and that was be honest. I turned on the mic, faded the record, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. This is my first day on the radio. My name is Larry King. That's the first time I've ever said that. <laughs> I have been sitting here scared to death, and you've been hearing music going up and down, probably wondering if there was an earthquake in the station. But I want to tell you, I was scared to death because all my life I wanted to be, I wanted to be in radio. Now I had my chance and I was scared. So bear with me. I really want this. I want it to work. So I'm going to do my best. At that minute, I had them and I never, ever again was ever nervous on radio or on television. 
because I learned a simple truth that day. If you're honest with your audience, you can't go wrong. If you screw up a record, so what? It's his first day. Any mistake you make, so what? It's his first day. Give the kid a break. So it forged me to go on and gave the audience an understanding of what I was going through. And after that, you need talent, you need persistence, you need everything else. But if you got that core, if you're going to be honest, and if you realize that it is not brain surgery, you are not operating on a brain. You're on the radio, you're on television. What you're doing is communicating. I'm going to tell you a story. I don't get to tell this very often, but I don't get to do commencement speeches very often. This is a story that would lend you to think that I would never have been a success, nor would any of the three people involved be a success. But it'll show you that you can make some mistakes, stupid, dumb things in life. I'll bet people in this room have done stupid, dumb things. And here you are, graduating the University of San Diego, that you would have said to yourself when you were 14 or 15, I will never get out of junior high school. But here you are. Well, I would have bet that I would never have gotten out of junior high school. This is what happened one day. One day we were in, I don't know how it works in San Diego, in, in New York City where I went to school, junior high school was 7th, 8th, and 9th, and then high school, 10th, 11th, and 12th. Far, is that the way they do it here? No? You have middle school here, you go to 8th, and then high school is four years? Oh, thank you, ma'am. You, you'll go far. <laughs> Quick action, nice guy. All right, we were in junior high school, went through ninth grade, then high school was far away. That's all important to this story. We were in 9B4. This was October, we graduated in June. We were 9B4, they spaced it then differently. 9B1 were A students. 9B2 was B students. 9B3 was C students. We were 9B4, meaning we're not sure. 9B5 were Neanderthals. One guy in 9B5 loved me because I removed a thorn from his paw. Anyway, one day, the story you're about to hear is true, and you would never have bet that any of the people involved would be successful. And I hope it encourages you to face failure, face dumb things, and still go on. Myself, Larry Zyga, soon to be Larry King, Herbie Cohen, who wrote You Can Negotiate Anything, who went on to become what Playboy magazine called the world's greatest negotiator, whose daughter attended law school here at San Diego, and Brazi Abati, who would later go on to be a brain surgeon in Buffalo, New York. Larry, Herbie, and Brazi, broadcaster, negotiator, brain surgeon. We're all 14 years old, we're all in 9B4, and one day, Gil Mermelstein did not come to class. We, his name was Gil Mermelstein, but we called him Mappo because he had head like a mop. He was just looking him up. His nickname was Mappo. So we go to Mappo's house. The shades are all drawn. There's a young man sitting in the front of the house looking forlorn. We ask him, what's the matter? And he says, well, Mappo got tuberculosis. And he and his mother and father have moved to Tucson, Arizona, where they're going to try to cure him. It's going to take at least a year. I am his only living relative. I'm his cousin. I live in New Jersey. So I'm here to wait till tomorrow to go over to school to tell him that Mappa would not be coming back. You can't leave a kid back because of illness, so Mappa would automatically go on to high school and he would never see Bensonhurst Junior High School again. He went back up to get ready to go to school the next day and then go back to New Jersey. Now, get this. Me and Herbie and Brazi are walking down the street and Herbie says, I have a brilliant idea to make money. We'll tell him Mappo died. We'll tell him he died. We'll raise money for flowers and candy and stuff. We'll go to the Nathans, we'll eat hot dogs, we'll go to movies. Yeah, but what happens next year? It'll be forgotten. It can't miss, it'll be forgotten, don't worry. 
he'll be in a high school 10 miles away. They'll make a joke about it. All right. So we go into class, go up to the teacher. We said, we went to Mappo's house. He's dead. <laughs> the teacher calls the office. The office calls Mappo's house. The operator says, phone disconnected. School marks him dead. We collect $211. And we're living like kings, man, living it up. Now it's three weeks later, and the principal asked to see us in his office immediately. Okay, we're walking down the hall, and here's a sign, failure is about to hit us. Brazzy wanted to be a doctor. He's crying, I'll never be a doctor, I'll never be a doctor. My father had passed away. I'm crying, my poor mother, how's she gonna handle this? Here's Herbie, the negotiator. No problem. I'll handle this, no problem. We get into his office, an unexpected thing happened. The principal was not mad at us, he was glad to see us. He didn't know us from Adam, it was a big school. Sit down, my three young friends. Would you like some coffee? No, well, let me tell you what's going on. The New York Times is starting a series of stories saluting junior high schools. High schools gets all the credit, so we want junior high schools to have projects. Well, we had a faculty meeting. What project could we here at Bensonhurst Junior High School do? And then one of the teachers told us how you, three boys, raised money in honor of your late friend. We looked up the records. Do you know that Gil Mermelstein is the only student in this history of this school to die? Most people make that leap past 14. So, he says, what we're going to do is we're going to have the annual Gil Mermelstein Memorial Award. <laughs> we're going to have an auditorium the day, two days before graduation. We will honor the winner. We'll invite his or her parents. We'll invite the New York Times. We'll invite the entire school and the assembly. We'll give the winner a replica, like a little trophy, and then in the hallway, We'll build a giant thing where every year we'll add the name of the next Gil Mermelstein Memorial Award winner. And we'd like the three of you to sit on stage in honor of your late friend. Congratulations and thank you. All right, we should have told them. We should have told them, but we were caught up in the ego of the moment. You know, we. So we're in the hall, we're walking along, and Herbie says uh, something I'll never forget. He says, you know, someday it will kick in. Someday Mappo will die. That's <laughs> <laughs> the way Herbie thought. There will be a Gil Mermelstein winner, right? <laughs> Only not this year. Now, okay, folks. We're on the stage. It's the day of the Gil Mermelstein. Now, we are so... Imagine the mixed emotions. We're sitting up there. We know Gil's alive. This whole place thinks he's dead. The winner of the award is getting his award. The principal is speaking. The New York Times is there with a photographer. Me and Bernie, me and Herbie and, and Brazia Body were all sitting on the stage in our brand new suits. And that day, that goddamn day, Mappo came back to school. <laughs> there's, uh, there's three ways he can enter the assembly. There's like Chinese little Herculean glass on the side or two big brass doors that lead on to 84th Street. Mappo chooses the doors. As he opens the door, the first thing he sees is the assembly's crowded and there's a big sign. Gil Mermelstein Memorial Assembly. Now, Mappo, Mappo ain't the brightest bulb in the world, but he knows what memorial means, right? <laughs> the kids in the back row look at him, look at us, and know right away, Herbie Brazzi and Larry glommed us for 211 bucks. This is a farce. They pulled it off. Now, they did this quickly because they were New York City kids. I don't take, I don't gloat about being a New York City kid, but there is one thing true about if you can get through the New York City school system, 
I'll put it this way. If you're a D student in New York, you're mayor of Des Moines. <laughs> you could phone it in. Anyway, these kids start to scream, and one of them yells to the principal, Hey, Mr. Principal, that's Mapo. Mapo is alive. <laughs> principal starts to look harried. Herbie gets up on the stage, actually does this. Go home, Mapo, you're dead. <laughs> Mapo flees. There's pandemonium. The winner of the award. Do I get the award? Do I get the award? The principal looks at the three of us. Veins are bursting out of his neck. Report to my office now. Immediately storms off. All right, now we're walking down the hall. Now Brazzy's a mess of tears. I'm crying. The New York Times guy is behind us. You, you faked the death? <laughs> what? And this was written in the New Yorker magazine, by the way, this whole story. Herbie, Herbie says, uh, I'll handle it. You're going to handle us? You're going to get us out of this one? He says, just watch. We go inside. I've never seen an angrier man in my life than that principal. The three of you are suspended from school for life. Go down to your lockers, empty your lockers. You're not going to graduate. Go home. I'm going to recommend Rikers Island. I'm going to recommend that you chop rocks till you're 18 years old, and then possibly a longer prison term because you have embarrassed me. You have disgraced me. And Herbie said, you're making a big mistake. Big mistake. When a kid is suspended in New York City, there's an automatic meeting before the school board. And we'll be suspended. We'll be suspended because we did a stupid thing. But someone on the school board is going to say to you, Mr. Principal, three dumb little kids go into class one day tell you somebody died, you make one phone call, the operator says deceased, you record him as dead, and then create an assembly and honor him with an award to be given out every year. Let me tell you this, we'll be suspended, you'll never be principal again in the city of New York. <laughs> Why don't we just forget the whole thing? And it worked. Uh, we all graduated, and the, the, the sum of it is we didn't graduate alphabetically, but we graduated by size. So, you know, who are the tallest went last. So as we're going down, Gil Mermelstein was right in front of Herbie, and the principal's handing out the diplomas, John Jones, Frank, 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 Frank. And then he says, Gil Mermelstein. Herbie says, I'll take it, he's deceased. Right. Now, the, the parable of that story is you can fail, you can look stupid, you can look dumb things. Nobody in that school that day would have said, those three guys are going to become Larry King and be seen all over the world. That guy is going to become a noted, noted brain surgeon, and the other guy is going to write books and be the world's most famous and best negotiator. All that happened because we never gave up. We were able to overcome our misfortunes, most of them self-caused. And then we went on to, of course, pretty lucky things in life. So if I have one message today is, if you goof, you have that bad day, things don't go right, be persistent. If you want something, don't give up. Woody Allen once said, 90% of success in life is showing up. And to the parents, I congratulate you. You've sent your kids to a great school. Now let them go on. Let them be what they want to be. Let them take chances. Let them fail. Failure is good. There's nowhere to go but up. So in conclusion, despite not receiving an honorary degree, I... <laughs> Just a little jazz. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you, this, this had nothing to do with what I've said, but you're a wonderful audience, so here's a little joke I just heard. And, and you can tell it later, tonight, wherever you may be. Two guys are walking along with their dogs. They're walking, and one's got a German Shepherd, 
One's got a chihuahua. German Shepherd, chihuahua, they got him on a leash. They come to a restaurant, the guy with the German Shepherd said, I'm gonna go and have lunch. The guy says, they won't serve you, you got a dog. He says, watch. Puts on a pair of dark glasses, goes in, the maid of comes up and says, yes. He said, I'd like to have lunch. Maid of says, but you have a dog. The guy says, but I'm blind. The maid of says, I apologize. Shows him to a cheat. The guy with the chihuahua sees this. Puts on a pair of dark glasses, goes in, says, I'd like to have lunch. The mayor says, but you have a dog. But the guy says, I'm blind. The mayor says, but you have a chihuahua. The guy says, they gave me a chihuahua. <laughs> have a great life. For John, don't give up.